You got an extra hour of sleep? Yeah. Let me tell you, I was talking to somebody just a couple moments ago, and I was trying to reinforce how much more awake and alive everybody's going to be. I said, you've got an extra hour of sleep and energy. And they said, remember, 11 o'clock is usually when we eat, so I got lost an hour here in the daytime, so I needed to keep that in mind. So um, anyway, everything's pushed back a little bit, right? So are you happy to be here? I'm, I'm happy that you're here. I want to welcome all the visitors, and I see a lot of visitors this morning. I do want to invite you visitors to fill out a visitor's card. It is part of your bulletin. You can see it on the insert. Just tear it off and send it in. Um, put it in the offering plate. We'd like to know who you are, and if you want any information on the church, we want to be able to correspond with you, so please fill that out and send it in. Uh, we thank you for being here, and just so that you know where you've arrived at, and know what the purpose of this day is. The purpose of this church is what, church? Glorify God. To glorify God in this service, everything that's said and done. So we appreciate you being here. I do want to say thank you last week. Um, I wasn't here last week. I had a, a weekend to where uh, Angie and I, we went out of town, uh, enjoyed ourselves. I went fishing and uh, just had a good time of relaxation. And I want to thank all the people that picked up the, the pieces and filled in and and just so thankful for uh, Blake doing the services last week and uh, know that you enjoyed that. So I appreciate him doing that and, and everybody that did that. So if you have a bulletin, please open your bulletin at this time. I just want to go over these announcements with you. A huge praise is last week we were talking about the, uh, uh, well, we did the trick or treat so others could eat, which is taking up food for Rowan Helping Ministries. Uh, the total was about 1,600 pounds of food was donated. So. That's a huge praise, and uh, I, I just praise God for the church coming together and doing that. I know it'll make a difference in everybody's lives, so, uh, and please be praying for them, especially on these cold days. Uh, it's, it's something for us to be able to say um, that we're blessed and a, a house sometimes we, we take it for granted. I know uh, I told the early service this morning, and the early service was packed this morning, so it's good to see both services, but um, last night, I know right before I went to bed, I actually... Uh, leaned over and told Angie, I said, you know, I'm hot. And because uh, we had the heat on. Of course, if you know Angie, the heat gets cut on. And um, I've lived in a house for all these years where she's tried to cook me from the, <laughs> from the, the inside out. And I told him this morning, you know, that's me. If they ever do an autopsy on me, it's going to be like that turkey on National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation <laughs> where they cut it and you open it up because she'll have the heat on. But anyway, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, there I said, man, I'm too hot. And immediately I was convicted thinking, on this cold night, I wonder how many people are cold, how many people are huddled together. And the heat is something I take for granted and you take for granted. So we need to pray for those that, that don't have homes during this time. And the Rowan Helping Ministry, that's a great place to be able to give to, to help those get out of the, the cold. So bulletin announcements this morning. Uh, if you look on there, you'll see that there are several meetings for today, uh, deacons meeting today, and then you see that the women have a meeting today, and then also you'll notice um, that tonight we have our evening service, and uh, it's supposed to be at 6, not 6.30, so make that correction there in your bulletin, and tonight we have our uh, third quarter business meeting here at church, and you think, well, I don't want to come to church because we're going to have a business meeting, but that's just God's family getting together, seeing what the Lord's done, seeing the opportunities He's giving, uh, and then we're going to have a fellowship meal after the service tonight. We're going to have a hot dog supper outside that's part of our birthday celebration where we celebrate the birthdays. And Crystal, what do they need to bring? Okay. Okay. But the church is providing the hot dogs and, and the things that go with the hot dogs. Okay, all right, sounds good. So make sure that you stay for that tonight, just a good time of getting together and fellowshipping tonight. And then also remember our Samaritan's Purse shoebox ministry. As you leave today, you'll see outside that you can pick up your shoeboxes and you'll see the, the bulletin announcement to, as to when to have them back. And then you'll also see the Rowan Helping Ministries coat drive. We're going to be having a coat drive. Actually, it starts today, and this is something that... Uh, the Sunday school class was doing the Jesus Seeker Sunday school class. Uh, I think they were getting it together. Anthony's going to speak about it next week, but uh, that's to be able to give people some coats that don't have them. Then there's going to be a nursery workers meeting next Sunday. Um, the seniors are having a Thanksgiving lunch on the 13th. 
the Youth Day of Thanks is the 22nd, so I'm just mentioning these things so that you'll be aware of them. And then today actually starts, um, we have another uh, baby pounding here, which is uh, Michelle Sloop. As her baby pounding starts today, there's a playpen that's outside for you to be able to bring things for her and Travis. And uh, know that I think her due date's December the 22nd, so we're trying to get them some supplies there. So ladies, make sure that you remember that. Any other announcements that we have before I go to prayer requests? The cantata practice is today at 5 o'clock for the children, and then on Wednesdays uh, and whatever other days specified will be the adult practices. As far as a, a prayer requests go, continue to pray for Brother Bob Lohman and Nancy Lynn and Jeff Earnhardt and Chloe Monroe. It's good to see um, uh, Jeff, Nancy, and Bob here today. It, it's always good to, to know that... Uh, you know, God's just blessing them as they're battling cancer and leukemia. Please pray for them as they go through their treatment. And then Brother Billy Hutchinson, continue to pray for Billy. Uh, lift him up in your prayers as he's continuing to gain strength. And then Amanda Collins. Amanda had to have a touch-up surgery last week, and she's uh, recovering from that. So please be praying for her, lifting her up. And then uh, also Joyce Stirewalt. She had uh, surgery this week, is doing well. Grady Morris, Grady was here at early service this morning, so that's a praise. Lisa Baker's here today, so both of them recovering from, sur from surgery. Um, and then it's good to see Van Benfield here today. We've been praying for Van for a while, that's Paul's dad, and he's with us today, so uh, it's just great to, that we're all getting to worship together. As far as uh, pregnant mothers go, continue to lift up Sabrina uh, and Michelle Sloop. Uh, Sabrina's right around the corner. Uh, I think her her due date is a couple of weeks from now or a week and a half, so please be lifting her up. And then Michelle, of course, the end of December. And then uh, a couple of people that we need to lift up. They've lost loved ones this past week. Uh, Tony Brown, he was at early service this morning, but he lost his mother this past week. The funeral was this past week, so be praying for him. And also Donna Flowers. Donna lost her mother last week, so be lifting her up and praying for her. And then um, Celeste Beecham is on a mission trip in Israel, so please be lifting Celeste up traveling at this difficult time, but she felt led to go, so be praying for her. And I'm sure you have a prayer request. If you want to mention your request by just raising your hand, the Lord sees those hands, so we'll pray together. Father, we love you so much and just thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for being so good to us all the time. We thank you, God, that you've given us a place to come and worship, and we thank you that you've given us the freedom to worship and the, the physical ability to come in here today, Lord. I, I don't want to take that for granted. Lord, we pray for those that can't be here. We pray for those that are sick and suffering. We pray for those that we've mentioned this morning and those on the prayer list and those that were mentioned by the hands that were raised. For those that are sick and suffering, Lord, we just pray that you would minister to them in healing. Lord, that if they're battling disease or facing surgery or recovering from surgery, we just pray, God, that you would minister to them. And Lord, we believe in your healing power. We pray a believing prayer, accepting whatever your perfect will is. Lord, we pray for those that are discouraged those that are going through difficult times, those that are mourning and grieving, that you would just give them that comfort during this time. Lord, we ask you today just to be with us so, so strongly in this service. As we come in here, Lord, I pray that you just reveal yourself to us. If there's anyone here today that's never trusted your son Jesus as their Savior, I pray that today, Father, they see their need for salvation. And I pray today, Lord, as each Christian is in here and they hear your word, I pray, God, that you show us ourselves. Show us ourselves in where we stand with you. Show us ourselves, Lord, in our obedience to you. And show us ourselves, Lord, in our closeness to you. Lord, give us this opportunity. Speak to us today, Lord. Remove the distractions that we have in our mind. Lord, our agendas, our schedules, our disappointments in life. I just pray, God, that you would take them off our mind so that we could see what you have to say to us. Lord, as we lift up our voice in song and offer this offering of praise, I pray, Lord, that you receive our offering of praise and that you just come upon us, Lord, in a cloud, in the presence, Lord, that, that only you can give us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is anybody ready to sing? This is an offering of praise that you're going to lift up to the Lord. So if the Lord has given you voice this morning, if he's given you the ability to be able to praise him, stand up and we're going to praise him together. This morning, page 288. Good morning. It's up on the screen too if you don't want to use your hand. Just a closer walk with me. We'll sing all three verses for you. Give me here. 
crowd this morning. I am weak, but thou art strong. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. And I'll be satisfied as long as I
You may be seated this morning. morning, I want to ask you to uh, worship with Sister Rachel as she sings a song that is simply entitled The Judgment. Listen to the words as she sings. It's not just the melody line, but listen to the words as well. judge ascends the throne. The book of life is opened as countless souls began to moan. From the throne comes a voice like thunder. in this book are the souls my blood has bought. Faces turned as into that courtroom comes the very seed of sin. He who was the saint's accuser must face the charges against him. With the fury of all the ages, that demon voice. It's not fair, I almost had you on Golgotha, I watched you die. Then Satan began to tremble as his fate to him. Attention as 
as the redeemed began to sing heaven's choir resounds the anthem you are our savior lord and king heaven's choir resounds the anthem you are our savior lord Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful time of year. Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to gather here together and worship in your name. Dear Lord, I just pray for the message that you'll have might bring this morning, dear Lord. Lord, I pray that will touch each and every one of us. Dear Heavenly Father, I also pray for those, those who are lost, Lord, that might not know you. Dear Lord, I pray that today will be that day. Lord, that something speaks to them and they open up their heart to you, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just a we're just a bunch of sinners, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, without you we could do nothing. Lord, we pray that we just pray that we'll be the church, Lord, that that just glorifies your name. Lord, to be that light for you in this world. Lord, we, we just love you. We thank you and we praise you. In your precious and holy name, amen. Everybody stand up. What can wash away the sins? There we go. I'll give you a clue what we're ready to sing next. We hear a crowd this morning. precious blood that we sing about this morning. We thank you for the many blessings of life that you share with us so freely each and every day. As we take a moment to give back a portion of those many blessings, bless each gift and giver, bless all that we have, 
and that you give us to the glory and everything that we give for the glory of your kingdom. Be with Mike as he leads us. Fill him with the words you would have us to hear to be better servants for you. All these things we ask in your son's precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask all the young people, if they would, to please come forward this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did everybody get an extra hour of sleep this morning? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. I'm going to ask you something today. I'm going to see if you understand it. I think you do. It's, a, it's just a, a little request that I have. Um, I'm going to ask you, if you will stand up and say, I love the Lord, then I'm going to give you... <laughs> Good job. Then I'm going to give you... Fruity snacks, okay? Now, the first person that stands up and says, I love the Lord, I'm going to give you fruity snacks. Come here, Jack. <laughs> My man. All right. Good job. Now, what did I tell, what did I tell you? What did I give everybody the opportunity? What did I say? Tell me my statement. What I, love did, I love the Lord. You're exactly right. But what did I tell you I would do? Repeat it. If, say with me, if, if I told you, if I told you to say, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord. Then, then, say then, 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 I'll give you fruity snacks. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That was what we call an if-then statement. If you do something, then I'll give you fruity snacks. Here you go. There you go. How easy was that? How did you get your arm out there? Okay, here you go. Here you go. All right, you can go sit down. All right. Now, he listened and he believed. He believed I was going to give him fruity snacks. Jack, did you think I was going to give you fruity snacks? You didn't have any doubt in your mind. He believed my then. So he did the if. Now, what if I didn't have any fruity snacks? Could I promise that? I could promise it. But if I didn't have any fruity snacks, well, I wouldn't have been able to give him any, right? So, I think sometimes we believe people that, that don't really have the then part of it. In other words, I want to try to explain it to you. The only person in the world that you can trust when they say, if you do something, then I'll give you something. The only person you can trust is God. Okay? 
even the things that you think you know, just like this ball, like let's just take something simple, like this baseball, right? If I throw this ball up, what happens to it? It comes, comes back down. What do we call that? Gravity, exactly. If I throw it up, tell me what happens. If I throw it up, then it comes down, right? So we know that. How many people believe if you throw something up, it always comes down? Then it always comes down. You believe that. You say that's pretty simple, right? So what? It comes down. You're exactly right. What if I throw it up right above my head? What's going to happen? Then it's going to come down and do what? Watch. I thought you said it was going to come down and hit me in the head. Oh, somebody caught it before it happened, right? So even your if-then, even though you know that if you throw something up, it comes down, even your if-then with a baseball didn't work, right? You know what? If you ask a lot of adults out here, there's a lot of things that we think if that the then doesn't happen. But God's if-then always happens. And sometimes you'll think, if I do this, it's not going to work out good, but if God tells you to do it, then he'll stop the normal things from happening. He'll jump up and keep something from getting you. Isn't that great? God's if then is different than our if then. But you know his biggest if then? He says, if you accept my son Jesus as your savior, then what? What happens if you accept Jesus as your savior? Somebody tell me. Then what? Tell me, Hunter. It won't Yeah. Then Jesus will come into your heart and he will save you. If you accept him, then he will. If you don't, guess what? He won't. You're exactly right. So God's if then is a big deal. Now whose if then would you rather listen to? God. God. Absolutely. I didn't even give you a choice. You'd rather listen to God's if then, right? Now I'm going to give everybody a chance. If you all stand up and say, Lord, I love you as loud as you can, then I'm going to give you fruity snacks. Right? Good, Jasmine. Come on over here. Good job. Good job. I'm going to give everybody else a chance. If you want to say it, then I'm going to give you fruity snacks. Stand up together and say it on three. One, two, three. Man, come over here. Come over here. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. You want to? Lord, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for these children, Lord, just how true they are to you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just use them, do mighty things with them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let me give you here. What happened? Here you go, bud. There you go. Here's a pretty snack. There you go. There you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. There you go. Here you go. Here you go. Thank you all for, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here you go. Oh, you get another one, Jack. You stood up and said it. There you go. Here you go. You're welcome. You only get one. Here you go. Here you go. Thank you, guys. Here you go. You're welcome. Toby. Toby. Here you go, bud. How many people have your Bibles today? Stand up and raise your Bibles above your head. Bear witness of God's Word. Amen. You may be seated. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4. Our text today will be out of the book of Matthew, it will be out of the book of John, we'll, we'll be a little bit of everywhere, but if you want to get to a place and sort of just camp, then go to Matthew chapter 4. You may want to hold your place there, we're going to be in John chapter 3 also. Now if you listen to the children's sermon today, you, you have a little prelude of what we're going to talk about. Last week. I had the opportunity to be gone, and I was, I was fishing. I love to fish. 
But there's a difference in fishing and catching. I love to fish and I love to catch fish. Now, I love to fish regardless, but as I was fishing last week, I kept hearing this one phrase. And it's a phrase that I'd studied on, so it, it came to my attention. I saw this weeks ago, and I thought, hey, this is, this is pretty neat. And as I heard everyone keep saying it, the, the statement was this. If then, if then. How many times every day do you think you hear this statement that includes these two words, if then? Has anybody ever heard that statement, if then? And I'm telling you, the fish weren't biting great. And this person beside me said, you know, if the wind would shift and it would start to blow from this way, then we're going to catch fish. And I was thinking, man, I, I wish the wind would shift. <laughs> and then the fellow beside me said, if you use this kind of rig, then you're going to catch fish. Now, I was using that kind of rig. And then I thought to myself, if I could just fish in that guy's spot, then I think I would catch more fish. So of course, I did the old thing where you get to know him and you talk to him and you just mosey on over here and right when he gets ready to leave, you get his spot, right? If then. All these things were based on if then. And we had those if then things all the time. But I'm telling you, no matter what if I did, it wasn't a promise then because I didn't catch any more fish doing the ifs. None. And everybody had a, a bunch of opinions on if, right? If you just do this, if you just do that. And I think... I could give you example after example to where our if-then rules, well, they, they just don't work out the way we think. I, I could give you the example of school. I remember being in school, and young people, you know, you could go to school, and you think, okay, well, I've got this to do, this project, and if I go and work on this project, and if I do this, then I'm going to get the best grade in the world, and the then doesn't work out like the if said it would. And Then there's... A lot of people who go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, I think you're sick. If you take this kind of medicine, you're going to be better. So you take that kind of medicine and how many people know it doesn't always work out that way? He can't promise you the then, can he? He can give you the medicine and say if you do it, but he can't promise you the then. I think about marriages sometimes as I'm counseling people and the person says, I just thought if I would do this and if I would do that, then my marriage would be fine. But the then didn't work out like they thought the if would. I think every time I watch the weather, and I plan my day and you plan your day and you hear the weatherman say, we're going to get rain. If this storm front comes to here, and the low pressure pushes this this way, and the high pressure pushes this this way, and the wind doesn't go there. If all these things happen, then we'll get rain. Is the weatherman always right? No. And so as I begin to think, I'm thinking to myself, hey, this is huge. My whole life is based on if-then statements. And I don't want to get too deep right off the bat, but think about it. Everything that we see disappointment from is based on a situation where our then didn't produce what we thought the if would. True? Man, I've had some good plans. I'm here to tell you. Hadn't you? Hadn't you had some good career plans? Hadn't you had some, some good financial plans? And they all started in your mind when you said, you know, if, 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 and I've even prayed for him, Lord, if you'll do this and if you'll do this, I sort of walk the Lord through what he needs to do, right? Don't you? If you'll just do these, then here's, here's what's going to happen. Problem is, it was my if then. You see, we base our life on if then statements and an if then rule that's not always certain. So, as I see this and I'm thinking about that and I listen to everybody around me thinking these ways, well, I realize something. We all have set our life up on an if-then rule that's not certain. No wonder we go around anxious. No wonder we go around afraid. No wonder we go around uncertain, not confident, worried about things because we've set our life on an, an if-then rule that's not certain. The reason that we have any disappointing day 
The reason that we even categorize something as disappointing is because we believed in the if, but the, di the then didn't turn out like we thought. How about that? Think of any disappointments you've had in life. Right now, everybody, think of any disappointments you've had. And you can put it in this category. The then didn't turn out like you thought it would if the if was in place that you put there. Every disappointment. Wow, this could get heavy, right? I've noticed something that's amazing. You see, none of our if-then rules are certain. We all use our own if-then rule every day to help solve our problems. But the truth is that even though logic tells us if we do something, then we'll get this certain result. None of our if-then rules are certain at all because of one big reason. We can't control the then. How in the world can we even claim our own plan, if-then plan, if all of us know we can't control the then? But we do it every day, don't we? And when it doesn't work, the only then is disappointment. So the amazing thing is, if you look, God knew this about us. He knew it. So he's, ever since the Bible began, has been trying to tell us this in Scripture. And I could give you Scripture after Scripture. I'm going to give you some today. But what God has tried to tell us since the Bible began to speak to us is this. That if we would live our lives based on God's if-then rule instead of our own if-then rule, then we will be able to live a life of certainty, a life of confidence and a life without the fear of everyday disappointment because God is the only one who can control the then. Think about it. I'm going to give you a recipe this morning that will help you not lead a fearful life if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it's the key, it's the answer to you being able to start a life based on God's if-then. You see, the Bible shows us so many if-then statements, but you see, these are God's if-then statements. They're based on God's if-then rule. A couple of verses you know, and, and these are familiar verses, so I'll, I'll tell them to you. You know, there's a verse in 2 Chronicles, and we quote this verse a lot of times, but it's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It's when Solomon was getting instructions from God. He was building the temple, and, and we're going to be in Matthew in a minute, but just listen, hear me out. This if-then statement is huge. As a matter of fact, it could solve every problem we have in the United States of America today. You realize that? He said this statement, listen, if, say that word with me. If. Again. If. if. Have you heard people before say, that's a big if? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Listen, I've listened to political ads. I've listened to people say, hey, what about this plan? If we put more money into here, if we do more programs here, if we do this and that, then this country can get back. Wrong. That's man's if-then plan. God's if-then said there's one way to get the country back on, on track. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, it doesn't call unsaved people to do it. It calls saved people to pray for it. You realize that? Saved people want to blame everything on non-Christians. God speaks to saved people and he says, if you, you which are called by my name will humble yourself and pray, seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, which means repent. Then, God's if then is for real. All these people today say, well, America has no hope. Nothing's going to happen. We can't get back on the right track. Hey, I want to go build me a shelter somewhere and put all these things in it because the bad things are going to happen. America's got no hope. We've lost our time. Listen, God's if-then statement tells you never to give up. If my people call on my name and repent and turn around, then I'll hear your prayer and heal your land. That's an if-then statement from God. It's the only one that'll work. And I haven't heard it on a campaign platform yet. 
How about that? In Scripture, in the book of Genesis, there was a man named Abraham. You're familiar with him, right? God told Abraham. Abraham had a nephew named Lot. He went over to Sodom because he saw the bright lights, and that city began to be wicked, wicked, wicked. They indulged in all the things that money could buy. They were selfish. They loved sexual sin. It became okay for them to be able to sin, even though God said it was wrong. And even though if you know the laws of nature, you know it's wrong. They said it's right, and homosexuality took over in there. They passed laws that said it was okay for men and men to be married and women and women to be married you say did they i just threw that in (laughs) don't you know they did they accepted it god said it's an abomination to me and i'm gonna destroy it now listen to what god said listen to this if then statement genesis chapter 18 and the lord said if i find in sodom 50 righteous within the city then i will spare all the place for their sakes Listen, if I find 50 righteous, then I will spare it. So, hey, I want to tell you the other side of the if-then statement. The one side of the if-then statement says, if you obey God, if you do what he says, if you humble yourself, then he'll bless you, then he'll heal you. The other side says this, if he could find 50 righteous people, he'll spare that city. Now, if you don't meet God's if and they didn't, how many people know they didn't, spend, they didn't find 50 righteous people? The other side of God's if then is, if you don't do it, guess what happens to Sodom? Then he destroyed them. So the if then statement works both ways, right? If you obey God, then God's going to put his favor and blessing upon you. If you do not obey God, then God's going to judge and punish you. If, then, statements. Big deal, right? God told Moses and the children of Israel before he was giving out the Ten Commandments in chapter 18, he said, If thou shalt do this thing, and God commanded thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all the people shall also go to their place in peace. See, God promises favor if we go by his if then. I love Exodus 19.5. Moses is walking up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments from God. And he says, now therefore, if, say that word with me. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. Who can make that statement but God? God said, I own everything. Basically, if, if. You obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you will be a special, special people, a treasure to me. And I will give you of what I have. God has everything. So he makes an if-then statement that says, hey, if you trust and obey me, then I'll reward you. There was a man that led the children of Israel after Moses. His name was Joshua. He had a friend named Caleb, and when they got to the promised land, before they even became the leaders, everybody else wanted to turn around because there were giants in the promised land. There were fortified cities, and they were afraid because the people were big. And Joshua and Caleb, in Numbers 14, they told the people, listen to their statement, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. This is the voice of two confident men. And you say, why are you bringing this up? Because I'm telling you, if you and I would begin to live by God's if-then rule, you would walk through this life not in fear, not in worry, not in anxiety, but you would walk through this life with a confidence like Joshua and Caleb have that says, if God said it, he'll do it. And if God is for me, who can be against if-then statements that God says, well, they're undisputable. But my if-then statements, I could give you a couple of hundred that just didn't work out the way I thought. What about you? Joshua 24, 20 gives us the other side of this too. It says, if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after 
that he hath done you good. Now listen, Christian, I want to key you in on something. He says, if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, do you realize he's not talking to unbelievers here? You can't forsake God if you've never been with him. He said, if you forsake God, that means somebody may be in here that's been living with God before, that's been walking with him, that's been praying regularly, that's been in the word, that doesn't miss a chance to come and worship. They know in your household God is first. He's above everything. You've walked with him, but you've began to serve strange gods. You say, there's no gods in my house. Well, the gods in our day don't look like the gods in their day. It's not the Asherah pole or the goddess of Diana. It could be the Samsung. It could be the Apple. It could be any kind of device that we give all this attention to and make it our God. Hey, it could be our job. Hey, it could be our money. Hey, here's a big one. It could be our sports activity or whatever we want our children to be involved in. They know it's God because it comes before God every time something's on that agenda. You say, that's not a strange God. It's what you're worshiping instead of worshiping God. It's a God. He's saying, what happened? You forsook God's if then that said, if you obey me, if you continue to come near me, if you continue, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless you. You, you. you forsook that. I've done it before. I know I'm speaking from experience. If you forsake that and say, my plan says, no matter what, if I do this, then I'm doing the best thing that's for my family. I'm doing the best thing that's for my children. I'm doing the best thing that's for my career. I'm doing the best thing for my bank account. If my plan works, then this is going to happen. When you forsake God for your own if-then plan, you can not be blessed. You say, how do you know if it's God's if-then plan or my if-then plan? If your if-then plan, whether it's a job, whether it's a career, whether it's an activity, whether it's a hobby, if your if-then plan takes you away from prayer, worship, or fellowship with God, it's not God's if-then plan, it's your own. That's a clear sign. It might be with the best intentions. But we're going to learn how those come to us. You see, I want to simplify it all by saying God's if-then rule is pretty simple. I want you to tell the person beside of you, just lean over and say, God's if-then rule is simple. Listen, here it is. You ready? Simple. Two sentences. If you obey me in your love and worship, then I will bless you. If you obey me in your love and worship, then I will bless you. If you disobey me, then you will be judged and punished. God's if-then rule is the same as my if-then rule is in my own house, right? Children, if you obey me, then I want to bless you. I want to give you favor. If you disobey me, what is going to happen? What's going to happen if you disobey me? Boys, what's going to happen if you disobey me in my house? What's going to happen? Am I going to just forget it? No. What's going to happen? Punishment, right? Know all about that. Not that they're bad or nothing. I'm just saying. But it's got to always be like that. Now, I'm not the perfect father, but, pun but disobeying, you can't get rewarded for that. I don't come home and say, hey, I see you didn't listen to me. I want to give you this. Yeah. Right? So why are we so naive as to think God will? Yeah. Why do we think God's going to pop up and say, hey, you know what? You put all these things in front of me. I want to reward you for it. I want to make your if-then plan work out. I know that you, you decided to make a career move, and that career move doesn't include me. It takes you away from worship, and you've decided to start putting so much time away from me. I, I want to reward you for that. Is that going to happen? It's never going to happen. I've decided... Uh, to pick up this hobby that makes me spend so much more time away from my wife and my family and 
I've decided to stay in here and play this video game, men. I'm so, I'm so ashamed of men these days. Hooked on video games while their family starving for their attention. I've decided to play, sit in here, play this fantasy league or this video game or be involved in this when my family needs to do that. You think God's going to bless that? No, he's not going to bless that. If, if, then, if God's, if, then his then's going to work. Our if then doesn't, it, it doesn't add up ever, ever, ever. Now, you might think right at this point in the sermon, I got this, and that seems like the easiest thing in the world to do. Well, we re really wouldn't be preaching about it if it was really easy to do. As a matter of fact, I think all of us fail at this. All of us fail, and here's why. You see, we have an if-then rule that comes from Satan, too. You see, Satan has an if-then rule. He's the counterpart. Now, you might have said, well, everything you gave us was from the Old Testament. So for those people that want to cry Old Testament all the time, let me give you some New Testament. It comes from a pretty credible source. His name is Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus preached God's if-then rule. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word. That means if you keep on following me, then are you my disciples. Now how many of us in here would say, hey, we're disciples of Christ. Do you know that you're not a disciple of Christ because you decided one day to follow him? You're a disciple of Christ if you're still following him. Those that continue to follow me, if you continue to follow me, then. See, you know, I've said those two words a lot, if, then, because I want you to realize when you leave here, you're going to hear them all the time, you're going to say them all the time, but I don't want you to take my word for it. I don't want you to come out of here and say, hey, Pastor Mike said this, or Pastor Mike said this. I want you to be able to say, the Bible says this. And, and I want to give you a couple of facts. These things blew my mind when I started researching this. The word if, as far as the Bible states it, if is used in the Bible 1,595 times. If is a condition, right? 1,595 times. The word then is used in the Bible 2,168 times. And the if-then statement is used 307 times. You think God's trying to get something across? From the beginning to the end of the Bible, he continues to give us scenarios, even where the words that aren't used, that he makes if-then statements. Simply, if is the condition, then is the consequence or the promise. If is the condition, then is the consequence or promise. We do that as, as we raise children all the time, right? If you don't listen, I'm going to punish you. If is the condition, then is the promise. If you do good in school, I'm going to reward you. If is the condition, then is the promise. If we're not supposed to do something, then the consequence is bad. If we are supposed to do something, the consequence is good. Here's the thing. God has never, ever broken his if-then rule. How many of us can say that about our own? God's never broken his if-then rule. He's never given an if and failed to deliver the then. Not one time. How about that? So whose would you want to follow? You see, the then is the promise that God gives if the condition is met. Always. Something that we can wrap our mind around that's a verse that's really familiar to us. and I think most of us could quote it, but these three verses here, John 3, 16, 17, and 18. If you think about these three verses, I know I told you to turn to Matthew, but, but turn over here. You say, I know it. Okay, go ahead and turn. I want you to see verse 18 because you don't know it really well, I don't think. Verse 16 begins, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus said, believeth in him, but do you know what I'm saying? How many people know that verse? That's a verse of salvation, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but should, shall, is going to have everlasting life. 
And verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You say, I didn't see if in there. You didn't, but guess what it said? It said, if we believe that Jesus died for us, that his blood is the only thing that can forgive our sins and bring us to God and use God's gift as our means of salvation, then we will never perish. We shall have eternal life. Did you hear that in that verse? If we believe, then we shall never perish. We shall have eternal life. That's an if-then statement. But the other side is John 3, 18. If we choose not to believe, then we are condemned. Now I want to tell you something. The if condition is always followed by the then consequence. And if you don't believe, then you are condemned. That's just as big an if-then statement as if you believe, you're not condemned. We don't want to preach that one much, though, do we? We want to preach the other one that says, if you believe, then you're not condemned. But the if then means that, hey, if you don't do his if, then you are condemned. You say, should we preach it more? Well, my Bible tells me that the gate that leadeth to destruction, that path is wide. So there's a lot more going on that path. I think we need to preach it, don't we? Now, I told you a minute ago that if everybody could just say, okay, God's if then. I'm going to follow if then, and it should be clear. Well, listen, the devil tries to confuse us. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he's the author of confusion. God's not the author of confusion. The devil is, right? The devil continually wants us to think about his if then statements, his if then rules. How many people know that the devil, he's got if then rules too? His if then rules different than God's if then rule. I'll give you an example. Christian, here's an opportunity in your life. A door is open and you're thinking about something and you're going to make a career move. It's going to bring you more money, which makes you think in your mind, I'm going to be able to take care of my family. I'm going to be able to give them more. I'm going to be able to do this. But with this opportunity, it's going to take me away from being able to worship. It's going to distract my mind so much that or it has distracted my mind so much that I haven't prayed like I should. The devil puts an if-then there that says, if you do this, then all your problems are answered. If you do this and get more money, then all your problems are answered. That's a big one that he tells us all the time, right? I can show you people with money and problems. Did you hear that? I can show you people with money and problems. The devil says, if-then, guess what? It's a lie. So how do you know? See, the problem with the devil's if-then statement is he's a liar. Jesus called him a liar in John 8, 44. He said he's a liar and the father of it. Let me give you another if-then statement from the devil. The devil appeals to these young people. And he tells these young people, hey, you're in high school and you have met the woman that you want or the guy that you want. And that guy says to that woman, listen, now listen, I love you, but I think we'll be closer if you would share your body with me. And that guy's a Christian, that girl's a Christian. They know that God said in his word that sex between man, between husband and wife is the only sex that God condones in the Bible. The rest is premarital sex, which is called fornication. It's sex outside of marriage. So God says, if you do that, then I can't bless you. But the devil comes in and the devil says, if you do this, then then he's going to be so committed to you. If you just give him this, then he's going to be so committed to you. And he begins to tell that little girl that. He begins to tell that young woman that. If you do this, if you give it yourself, then it's going to work out good. Then it's going to work out good. How many times does it work out good? You know why? It's the devil's if-then lie. And I'm not putting it all on the, the boys. I mean, the girls are just as guilty a lot of times. I'm saying here, that's another if-then lie. The devil if-thens us with any kind of different sin and makes it appealing so that we think the then is going to work out if we do the if, but 
if that if and then doesn't match with God's word, then you're going to fail. You say, well, how do you know the devil does that? Remember Matthew chapter 4? We parked there. You see, the devil can always make if-then statements, which have a promise, but because he's a liar, I want you to notice what happens. He's been making them for a long time. This is a story, the temptation of Jesus Christ. How many people remember this story? Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Do you remember this story? I want to read you a couple of things, and these stood out to me. In this temptation, Jesus went out in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten in 40 days. He's been hungry. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards and hungered, verse 3, and when the tempter, who's the tempter? That's, the, that's Satan, that's the devil. When the tempter came to him, he said, I want you to see this, if. You see that word in your Bible? Say it with me. If. Again. If. He tempted Jesus by saying, starting his temptation, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Jesus had to come back and straighten him out by giving him scripture. But notice the devil didn't give up. He came back and the first time he tempted him with provision. That's the way he tempts us too. Hey, do this. Do this plan in life and you'll be able to have more, which will make you more comfortable. You'll have more money in the bank. You'll have a, a nicer house to live in. You'll drive a nicer car. Here's the temptation. Don't worry about what God says. Provision he tempts us with and then he tempts Jesus with immortality. Notice the next temptation, verse 6. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And Jesus had to quickly correct him and say, you don't tempt the Lord thy God. And the next time he tried to tempt him again, he said, if thou wilt, verse 9, all these things will I give to you if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Here's an if that the devil's throwing out. I'm going to give you everything if you fall down and worship me. Can you believe he tried that on Jesus? He tries it on us every day. If you'll go by my plan, the one the world's going by, you're going to have more and you're going to have more fun. If you do this, then I'll give it to you. Guess what? The devil is a liar and you have to discern between his if then and God's if then you say how can we do it if God's if then is to you it will be backed up in the scripture if you have an opportunity in life young lady young man to do something whether it's join a group of friends and you say well hey if I join this friend group I'm going to be more popular uh, people are going to accept me more that's what I want if I do that but those people they don't talk the way that represents God's way they don't do the thing that represents God's way if you join that group of people if you do that then you will get the result the devil promised you but the, but the Bible tells you if you see sin flee from it so you can't do the devil's if-then statement just because you think it's going to make you more successful or more popular. You can't fall into the boyfriend or girlfriend's lure that says, if you do this, I'll be more committed. That's the devil's lie. When the Bible says, see, see sin and flee from it, that's God's if-then. He said, I'll reward you. When he tells you, young person, abstain, keep yourself pure, that's his if-then. If you do it, he'll reward you. God's if-then is different. You say, how do we know the difference? The difference is God's if then will never, ever, not one time, differ from his word. The devil's if then is something you will always have to compromise what God tells you to do. Always. Does he tell you to pray to him? Does he? Does he tell you to read his word? Does he tell you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together? Does he tell you to worship him? If you have an idea in your mind that's an if-then statement that's going to take you away from doing either one of these three, it's not God's. It's pretty simple, isn't it? And that can be an if-then challenge. And God's ready to bless you. But if you choose your own path and it takes you away from worship, it takes you away from your relationship with God, it takes you away from prayer, it takes you away from fellowship, it's not going to, re to reward, the then is not going to reward blessings. Better move on. 
You see, God wants us to believe in his if-then rule. We call that faith. How many people have heard the word faith before? Faith, believing in something that you can't see or control. If we would start putting our faith in God's if-then rule instead of our own, do you realize that we would see miracles happen? Miracles, miracles. We don't say that word too much anymore, do we? Miracles, say it. I even like saying it. Guess what? I've been blessed to see some miracles. Now, I'm not the, the prototypical person that can stand here and say, hey, do everything I did. I can tell you more likely, hey, look at this section of my life and don't do what I did, right? Because I live by Mike's if then. And man, I had some good plans. It's just the then didn't work out because I had no control of it, right? And because if it felt good, if it felt good, then you do it. If it sounded good, then you go that direction. If it looked good, take it. Those are the devils, right? Understand something. With God's if then, you have to use faith. Actually, believing is something that we call faith. It's believing something that you can't see or control. Matthew chapter 9. Turn on over to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to talk about miracles for a minute. In this section of Scripture between verses 18 and verses 30, we're not going to read it all, but I challenge you to go back and read it. You'll see three miracles performed here. Three miracles. The first miracle is that there's a woman who has an issue of blood. The second miracle is that there's a daughter that's passed away, and she's, she needs to be raised from the dead. The third miracle is there's two blind men. So let me set it up for you, and I'll try to be brief. Jesus was walking... As he was walking one day, this ruler came up to him and said, Jesus, Jesus, I believe in you. Listen, here's the problem. My daughter has died. Pretty big problem, right? If you come and lay your hands on her, then I believe she'll be able to, to raise from the dead. This ruler, his faith was his if then. Listen to this scripture. Are you in Matthew 9? Listen to what he says. Verse 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Boy, he believed, right? What do we call believing? What's that word? Faith. Say it again. Faith. On his way to see the little girl, there was a woman in the crowd. And this woman had an issue of blood which means she had a blood disease. There was something that was going on with her. Nobody knew it but her. And she saw Jesus in the crowd. And Verse 21 says, For she said within herself, so the Bible even lets you look inside of her thoughts. It says, She said within herself, If I may but touch, if I may but touch his garment, I'll be whole. Now listen to this lady's inner if then. If I can touch his garment, then I will be whole. She didn't tell anybody, but she had a believing faith and said, if I can get to him, if I can get to him, and she got to him, her believing faith, and she touched his garment, and she was healed. There's more to the story, but that's not our focus here. The next thing that happens is he arrives at this, this ruler's house, and there's the little girl, and she's dead. And Jesus touches her. And she's raised from the dead. You see, the ruler believed. In other words, he had faith that if Jesus would lay his hands on his daughter, then she could be raised from the dead. He believed in the power of God's if then. It's different than our if then. All those people in the way said, if you, if you, you're not going to raise her from the dead by laying your hands. You know, all it took was that one man believing Jesus I believe in you. If you do this, then it will happen. That's his faith. At the end of the story, as he was leaving there, there's a couple of blind men that called out to him. Verse 27, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, listen to his question, Believe you that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. 
Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. What's the one thing that gave them sight? It was their faith. Be it unto you according to your faith and to your belief. You see, they believed if they could get to Jesus, then they could be healed. And Jesus quizzed them and said, do you believe if I say you'll be healed, you'll be healed? They said, we believe it. Do you realize that's, that's the key to all of, our, all of our confidence, all of our healing, all of our blessings? It's obeying God's if-then rule. Listen to this. There are so many people that, that go through things and all God is looking for is to see if you believe in his if-then rule. There are people that could have got God's healing, but they don't believe in the healing. There are people that could get God's blessing, but they don't believe in the blessing. If one and one don't add up to be two, well then, hey, I'm not buying it. Listen, God's in the miracle business. God's one and one makes three. Always. Those kids said, hey, you throw that ball up above your head, it's always going to come back down. That's the if-then rule we're teaching them of gravity, right? When Blake interceded and got that ball, that's God's if-then rule saying, if you trust me, I'll protect you. Malachi 3 says, he not only will bless you, he'll rebuke the devourer from you. In other words, he can stop stuff from happening to you. The world says don't do it. God says do it. You better do God's if-then rule. How about God's if-then rule? Faith, real faith is believing so strongly in the then that the if is something that we want to do. Did you hear me? God's if-then rule is believing so strongly in God's then that the if is something that we want to do. It's believing so strongly in God's promise that the condition is something that we'll gladly do. That's living by God's if-then rule. God said, I'm going to bless you if you go out and proclaim my name. The world says, I'm going to curse you if you say God's name. You better accept God's if-then rule and wait for your blessing. Not hunker down to the world's if-then rule and miss your blessing. See, God's if-then rule is different, right? You have to have faith. Hebrews 11 says, but without faith it's impossible to please God. For he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. Those that believe he is and those who diligently seek him. How many times in my life have I put my own plan into place? It's my own if-then plan, which I had help with because the devil influenced me. And I've missed the blessings of God. I want to close with a story in the book of Matthew. Another one in chapter 14. You know this story. Story of a disciple named Peter. In Matthew chapter 14... There was a big time, of, big time of miracle that happened as he fed the 5,000. And as Jesus left there, he went up to pray in the mountains. And the disciples got in a boat and they went across the, the sea, right? And he told them, go on, go on before me. That night, a storm came. When the storm came, I'm telling you, the wind blew. The waters became rough. They were frightened by the storm, but you know what frightened them even more? That in the middle of the storm, Jesus comes walking across the water. Now in our mind, even the mind that the devil works on, that doesn't work. It doesn't add up. The law of physics, the water comes up to the level of this platform. I can't step off into this water because it don't work. If I step in water, then I what? Tell me. I sink. I know that. Everybody knows that. So the world's if then was even messing them up. But here comes Jesus. And it says they were so afraid. They were afraid. But I want to show you what happened. Because this was a lesson on if then. You ready? Matthew chapter 14. He says in verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Here's a bunch of scared men. 
you know what? They're in trouble, and all of a sudden they see something that, that messes with their own if-then logic. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now listen, this is big. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, now I want you to notice this next word. What is it? Yes. Say it with me. Yes. If it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Peter is putting God out there and saying, Jesus, if it's you, knowing that you defy all my if then, tell me to come to you on the water. I have to read this next verse. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You see, the reason Peter walked on the water is because he believed that if Jesus told him to come, then he definitely could defy the laws of physics and walk on the water. This is a picture of God's if-then rule having more power than man's if-then rule. We know the law of gravity, right? We know that if I step in the water, I'm going to what? But Peter said, Jesus, you can defy all of this, and I will look at you and follow you. So if the water comes up to here, and Jesus tells you, come, and the world and all of your knowledge says, hey, that's not going to make people like you. That's not going to be good for your financial position. That's going to put you out there by yourself. That's not going to make your children happy with you. That's not going to make them popular because they, wanna be, they want you to put this before church. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. Listen, by all those things that the world tells you, you have to say when Jesus says, come and step and watch that you will always be on top of the water. That's what he's saying. Peter gave Jesus an if and Jesus said, come. You say, well, I know the rest of the story. I do too. But y'all spent years and years in the rest of the story. When Jesus said, come, I remember when I stepped out on the water and I accepted him as my Savior. But then what happened? Ah, our if then starts to take over. You see, Peter stepped out and he said, I'm walking on the water to Jesus. Glory to God. That was the minute on the mountaintop, wasn't it? Can you imagine the jubilation in Peter's mind when he said, I am walking on water and there is Jesus and none of this makes sense. And I can give you a lot of those, none of this makes sense, but God made it work out in my life, right? Can you? But all of a sudden, the wave hit Peter in the face and the wind blew his hair back and then he realized, hey, all these storms around me, hey, and that sea's pretty rough and my foot has nothing solid, but yet I'm walking. And he took his eyes off of Jesus and started to look around at the problem and started to think about his own if then. And something in his mind said, Peter, if you step out of the boat in water, you'll sink. Peter, if you get in the stormy water, you'll drown. Peter, you need to be afraid. And he took his eyes off Jesus. And what does the Bible say happened to him? He began to what? I want to sum this story up to you. Peter began to sink. Because he stopped believing in God's if-then and started believing in his own if-then. He was okay for a while. And don't you know that's what happens to us as Christians? We trust God and we believe. And then all of a sudden, some storm in life comes. We take our eyes off of him. The next thing we know, we're worried, we're frazzled. Or maybe we just got misdirected. We think, hey, this is what will make my family happy. This is what will make me be a better father, a better mother, but it doesn't include God. And all of a sudden, we realize we're sinking. Praise God for the end of the story. Peter. Verse 31. Verse 30. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord save me. I've cried that out before, hadn't you? Wave hits you in the face and you realize I'm sinking because I stopped believing in God's if then. That's what God does for us. He loves us. You see, in the middle of his walk to Jesus, 
he began to see the conditions of his environment, the wind, the waves. These are conditions that tested his faith. These conditions tested his believing in the then that Jesus had told him. Jesus said, come. That was the then. And the result is that he failed the test. And Jesus said when he got him up out of the water, a vow of little faith. See, it was a whole believing thing. You see, if the Lord tells you, if you do this, then I will promise that you'll be okay, and then we believe that by faith, then we will never fail a test because all of our tests in life are if-then challenges. Every single test you've ever had is an if-then challenge. God appeals to every person by presenting them this if-then rule. Faith is an if-then challenge. God gives us a, us a condition. That's the if. We have to believe in his power to deliver the then, which is the promise. And then we have to step out of the boat and keep our eyes on him. It takes faith to step out in a world that tells you you're doing something not popular. That's the world's if then. It takes faith to abide by God's if then, doesn't it? Amen. Young people, do you hear me? You're going to meet those challenges every single day. And you so much more in your generation because the world has lowered its standards. If you believe in the world's if then, and you're a Christian, you will not prosper. Young man, young woman, if you believe the devil's lie, what tells you to do something against what God said is right, you will not be blessed. You will be punished. You have to know that. You have to know it. God's if then says, I'll give you so much more, exceedingly, abundantly above all that you could ever think and imagine. And then for us adults, God's not going to leave you hanging. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's his promise. If you obey me, if you trust me, if you love me, then I will bless you. Then I will reward you. That's God's if then. It seems easy while we're all sitting in here, but we have to go out of here and we have to distinguish between the two, don't we? You see, our problem is that we're not willing to believe in God's if then. We don't believe in God's if. So we can't receive his then. God's if's the first statement. That's the first thing you have to do. In the case of something that God tells us not to do, what happens is we don't believe that if we disobey God, then we'll have to experience God's then, which is punishment. I believe that. I believe that. I'm going to tell you, and I told you this a, a while ago. I think the biggest heartbreak as a pastor, and I've told you before, I didn't know how to be a pastor. I didn't know a whole lot about it. But I can tell you this for sure. The biggest heartbreak as a pastor is sitting and waiting and watching Someone that you see blatantly go against God's if-then rule. And knowing that God's then is coming. And it's one of the sheep of this fold. And, and I pray for him. Because I've been that one before. And I know that God's then is always going to come. And I see when... An if has come up and the world's given them an if and they go this direction and uh, you start not seeing them involved how they used to be. You start not seeing their, their kids involved. You start not seeing them here, but just every once in a while, then less than that. And then, then not even making the things they used to. And, and then you can't hardly get them to fellowship. And, and, and then they're involved in this stuff. And then all these things happen and you sit and wait. And as a pastor, it breaks my heart because I know, I know the rule of if then. You do too. I've experienced the then for not doing the if. And I don't want anybody to experience that, but God's a righteous God. He loved me enough to give me the then. It's amazing to think that our faith in God our eternal life, listen to these big subjects here. Our faith in God, our eternal life, our blessings in this life, 
our direction in life, our witness of miracles, and our ability to walk through this life with a confident security instead of a fear of the unknown is all based on this one simple thing, God's if-then rule. Those are some big subjects. Now, if you've never believed in God's if-then rule and received eternal life through Jesus Christ, if you've never believed that Jesus died for you, his blood's the only thing that can forgive your sins, if you've never repented and asked him to come into your heart today, I want to tell you, if you believe, then he will give you salvation. Listen to this if then you can take today. If you believe, then God will save you today. And Christian, if you have believed, but you realize today, that you need to do better at living by God's if-then rule than your own, then come and ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him for His help and recommit to Him today. I just praise God when He shows us our own self. I don't need Him to show me you. I need Him to show me me. If He's shown you today that in the midst of your walk in life, you may have started walking to your own if then you can change that today and he's willing to give you help you come and you cry out to him like peter did and you say lord lord save me lord help me and guess what he does he says it's about time see the first step is admitting it repenting to it and then god will put you on the track and you can get that fellowship back with him God's if-then rule. If I look back on my life, and I, I want to put it in two categories. God's if-then rule, Mike's if-then rule. And I gauge everything by the peace that I had in life, the happiness that I had. My peace and happiness was when I was living by God's if-then rule. My worry, my turmoil was when I was living by Mike's if-then rule. It was full of disappointments because I never knew the then. Amen? Pray with me. Lord, I love you. I praise you. And I thank you for your precious word. I thank you, God, for showing us ourselves today. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that's never accepted your son Jesus as their Savior, I pray that today, Lord, they would see the necessity and they would have the boldness, Lord, to be able to step out. That they would have the, the desire, Lord, to to be able to answer your call today and take your promise of salvation through Jesus. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here today who is saved, that has realized it's so easy to start believing the devil's if then, and Lord, they just want to come back and make sure they're right with you, I pray, God, today you give them boldness to come and kneel before you and ask you for that help. Lord, use this message to change our lives. You've spoken to us through your word. Lord, what a huge principle you've shown us. You've been trying to tell us, Lord, ever since the Bible began to be written. I pray, God, that you let the Spirit have such a freedom to move in here today. I pray you give a boldness to people to cry out to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we begin to sing, I want to give you an invitation to tell you that anytime we have a message out of God's Word, it's the first part of a conversation. A conversation happens between two people. A message is a conversation. But the response to the message, well, that comes from you. Your response to God is what comes after this message. It's what you have to say back to God for what He's shown you about yourself through His Word. It's not the message that I preached. It's the message that he wanted me to hear and he wanted you to hear. So now's your opportunity. I'm going to be standing down here. If there's anyone that's in this room that is unsure of their salvation, there's doubts there and you don't know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. You're not sure. Or maybe you just know that you're not. I invite you to come. I want to pray with you. The Lord's calling you today, and He wants you to accept His Son, Jesus, as your Savior. He watched His Son bleed and die for you so that you could be with Him.
God. He offers you that today. It's a big if then, but you have to take the if. And Christian, I invite you today, come and give it to God. Use this time. Make sure that when you leave here today, you've understood exactly what he has told you and that you've responded to him. Stand with me. Page invite you to come back this evening at six o'clock. I appreciate you being so attentive to the word and I appreciate another opportunity that he's given us to be able to come together and worship. So I invite you to come back this evening. Uh, any announcements before we leave?
All right. I'll ask Scott Leslie if he would to dismiss us.